I would like to introduce you today to John Koskinen. Mr. Koskinen was nominated by President Obama to be the 48th commissioner of the IRS with a term from 2013 to 2017. Previously, John served as non-executive chairman of the board of Freddie Mac from 2008 until about 2012 with other stints as CEO, COO, and CFO. He was president of the United States Soccer Foundation, the charitable arm of soccer in the U.S. Mr. Kostinen earlier served as deputy mayor and city administrator for the District of Columbia, responsible for the operation of all city departments. Prior to his service as deputy mayor, Mr. Kostinen served as deputy director for management of the Office of Management and Budget, and prior to that, he served as assistant to the president and chaired the president's council on year 2000 conversion, coordinating the country's transition into the new century. So welcome, John. I'm delighted to be here. Yes, you are a fellow of the Academy of Housing and Communities, which means that you have forged public policy and the direction of housing and communities, and for you, the economy as well. What, what role generally did you play in the arena? Do you want to give, give us a little more information in the introduction? Uh, well, I'd be delighted to. Uh, as uh, your listeners can tell, I have a bit of a checkered employment career uh, since you covered only the last uh, really 25 years. The 25 years before that uh, were spent primarily in the private sector uh, doing uh, turnarounds of large failed enterprises, uh, one of which, uh, ironically, uh, was uh, we ran Levitt and Sons, uh, the famous home builder, <clears throat> for uh, three years in an antitrust consent decree in the 70s uh, between uh, ITT, IT&T and the U.S. Justice Department, <clears throat> in which IT&T had agreed to divest itself of Levitt, which it had bought in 1968. So I actually ran a home building company for about three years as the chairman, although as I used to tell people, <laughs> uh, it was important to have people who actually knew how to build houses working for the company at the same time. Uh, but my uh, association with the uh, academy really began when uh, I was asked by uh, the Bush administration <clears throat> at the start of the financial meltdown in 2008 uh, to become the chairman of the board of Freddie Mac as the government was preparing to take over both Freddie and Fannie uh, as at the front end of the financial meltdown. And then as you noted, my uh, deal with Secretary Paulson was I would become the chairman and restructure the board and the governance process, uh, but there would be a new CEO who actually knew how to run the place. Uh, but then by four months into it, uh, the CEO decided he really wanted to run a company and he just didn't want to be bothered with this set of meetings at the White House or the Treasury Department, and he just wanted to be the CEO. I tried to convince him that this was the biggest platform on which he'd be playing in the course of his career, but that didn't convince him. So as you noted, for about nine months, I was uh, a CEO, uh, chief operating officer, because we didn't have one. And then unfortunately, uh, CFO <coughs> passed away a month later. Uh, so as I used to kid, I drove to work one day and discovered I was home alone <laughs> in the C-suite. So <coughs> we spent a lot of time, obviously, uh, for that three and a half years I was there, uh, <clears throat> trying uh, to both restructure uh, the governance process at uh, Freddie Mac to ensure that uh, we were as transparent as we could, and we provided as much support uh, to the housing market as we could uh, as we moved through that process. <clears throat> it was, uh, as I told the employees when uh, Secretary Paulson and I first met with them uh, that Monday morning, uh, that I had been involved for 20 years in a lot of turnarounds and bankrupt companies. This was the first time uh, money was not an issue because the government had offered a backstop so that whatever funding Freddie Mae and Fannie needed uh, would be provided by the, uh, by the government. But our job was to try to help stabilize uh, the mortgage market and ultimately try to help stabilize the economy uh, <clears throat> by again, uh, being transparent, being supportive, uh, working through the foreclosure crisis that was going on continuing to provide liquidity uh, to the marketplace. So I gave an address to uh, the Academy in Washington uh, halfway through, noting 
that it seemed to me that there was going to take a little while to get these organizations uh, straightened out, uh, <clears throat> but that uh, it would be helpful at some point if they returned back into the economy. Uh, there were concerns at that time that part of the reason for the failures was the companies were very thinly capitalized. Uh, they had a relatively weak regulatory requirement uh, and basically we then were able to kind of run on their own and take care of whatever risk they wanted. But by the start of the uh, financial meltdown, there had been a new regulatory procedure put in place, a new regulator with very strong oversight capacity. In fact, uh, I used to maintain Freddie and Fannie now had greater regulatory control uh, over them than the banks and financial institutions uh, did, which I thought would reassure people. And it also seemed to me you could recapitalize the companies, requiring them uh, to have a higher uh, level of capital, three or 4%, much like the other financial institutions running, rather than running on a ratio of 100 to one, 1% uh, capital. Now, uh, then the third issue surrounding the uh, GSEs was the implied government guarantee. Uh, which allowed them to borrow uh, at a lower cost, which was good for the mortgage market, but <clears throat> ultimately a concern uh, to the public that in effect, there was a government guarantee uh, that Fannie and Freddie would uh, take advantage of in difficult times, but they weren't paying anything for it. And we did, and others did a lot of calculations and said, you know, you could actually quantify uh, the cost and the value of that guarantee. So my sense at the time was the three issues that had been raised, which were the level of capitalization, uh, the need for a strong regulator, and the requirement that you pay for the Im implied or even uh, uh, ostensible government guarantee would solve the basic problems. But shortly after I retired, actually, <clears throat> when I was restructuring the board, one of the lawyers said, you know, there's a retirement age here for board members of age 72 and would you like us to change that so you have a broader pool of candidates? And I said, absolutely not. That's my way out of here. So sure enough, uh, in February of 2012, I reached uh, age 72 and along with uh, uh, a director at Fannie and another director at uh, Freddie, uh, we retired. But by that time, the companies had stabilized and shortly thereafter, they had stabilized so much that the original deal with the Treasury Department was the Treasury would provide all the support that Fannie and Freddie needed, but nobody was trying to figure out what would happen when they began to be profitable. A lot of their losses were paper losses and those losses, paper losses reversed. So after I left, they changed the nature of the arrangement and it allowed the treasury to sweep any excess profits or capital from Fannie and Freddie. And you could see by 2013 that the market was turning around, the financial markets were turning around, the mortgage market was stabilizing. And so as I told, I told the Academy and, and others, once these entities started providing money to the government, uh, there were going to be a lot lower incentives <laughs> for the government to actually put them back into the private sector. Uh, it did not occur to me at the time that it would take this long uh, for the government uh, and the Congress to come to a plan as to how to actually restore the uh, agencies into the uh, private sector. One of the concerns was that uh, at the time that they had too much influence <clears throat> between Freddie, Fannie and FHA, you had uh, the vast majority of mortgage, uh, origin, uh, mortgage support in those companies. But since then, as I've noted along the way, uh, nobody in the private sector in any significant way is banging on the door saying, hey, we wanna get into this business. But one of the things the regulator did do was create a single platform that anyone could use to in effect uh, issue uh, mortgage guarantees because part of the concern was uh, Freddie and Fannie had partially a monopoly because they had enough volume uh, and a platform large enough that they could in fact uh, issue uh, mortgage guarantees uh, relatively easily, but it was a high barrier to entry for a new competitor. Uh, so that problem has been solved as well, but as everybody knows, Fannie and Freddie are still in government conservatorship uh, you know, seven years over, uh, going on seven, um, seven years or actually longer than that, actually from 2008 when I started. So it's really 12 years uh, since the government took over. Uh, I think one of these days that'll get taken care of. But of course, now we're in the middle of uh, trying to respond to the coronavirus. Uh, and I think that's going to delay things uh, somewhat. Uh, but moving forward, it does seem to me there is a relatively straightforward solution 
uh, to getting these companies uh, out of the government domain and back into the private sector. In the meantime, there have been a lot of discussions and proposals about how to uh, you know, get rid of them, replace them with other entities in the private sector. But as I say, uh, there's not been any momentum at all or anybody knocking on the door saying, hey, we would be delighted to go into that business. So if you're going to keep uh, the mortgage guarantee market, if you're going to keep uh, uh, people having access to 30-year uh, mortgage mortgages, you're going to need uh, the facilities that Freddie and Fannie provide. So I'm thinking back over those years, and you're saying 2008 to 2012, which are very key years in the housing market. Yes, there was a, a great concern uh, that uh, the market was frozen. Uh, <clears throat> there were uh, defaulted mortgages all over the place. No, right. the economy, uh, as a result, had uh, what's called the Great Recession, uh, the largest downturn since the Depression. And so the entire economy was struggling, and the housing market uh, was uh, you know, a leading indicator at that point of the problems. Uh, that were out there, and there was a concern as to how it was going to write itself. So how did all the foreclosures affect Freddie Mac? <clears throat> well, they basically uh, uh, were handled, I think, very efficiently. There were mortgage servicers and intermediaries who uh, handled a lot of the day-to-day -day work. Uh, yet, obviously, uh, particularly as you marked, there was a rule, accounting rule, you had to mark your assets to market. So as you marked a lot of the uh, foreclosures to market, those were the paper losses, uh, even before the foreclosures were fully processed, that Fannie and Freddie ran up so that they uh, received over $100 billion in support uh, from the government. But as I say, a lot of that, as the economy recovered, a lot of those mortgages and the defaulted mortgages uh, assumed greater value. And that's why suddenly Fannie and Freddie began to look like they were making money. Uh, the losses in many ways were paper losses and the gains were paper gains. Uh, but what really uh, turned things around was the basic economy uh, <clears throat> settled down, started to come back uh, and recover. And with that, the housing market followed and the foreclosures and the uh, issues started to resolve themselves. Uh, the private, I'm a private market kind of guy <laughs> in my old age. Um, you know, the market created a lot of cre uh, interesting solutions. There were in investment funds that went out and bought foreclosed houses. Uh, re, uh, <clears throat> uh, redid them, put them either back in the market for sale or rented them. Uh, and so that created demand that didn't exist before. And so the private sector response uh, really was what allowed the market to come back. In addition to your turnaround, home building and Freddie Mac experience, you headed up several other organizations. So let's start with OMB. What were your responsibilities there, John? I started at OMB actually in 1994 in the Clinton White House. Uh, I was nominated and approved by the Senate as the Deputy Mayor for Management, <clears throat> which meant that uh, all of the Vice President's reinventing government initiatives came through my office, and I was in charge of overseeing and coordinating the work of all the inspectors general, the CFOs across the government, and then we created uh, CIOs in every agency and had a council for them as well. And so that was my basic responsibility. <clears throat> As the president kidded at one point, uh, he brought me in to help manage the government, not shut it down. But I ended up running uh, the government shutdowns in <clears throat> the late, latter part of 1995. They were the longest shutdowns at that time uh, in history. And it was fascinating to try to make sure that we did it, uh, called it straight, that the things that were, didn't have money all shut down no matter what they were, uh, whether it was Defense Department production lines or Social Security or other issues, until they became a threat <clears throat> and the absence of work became a threat to life or property, which is the standard uh, as we ran. I also <clears throat> was asked when I started coming out of 20 years in the private sector of journey turnarounds at my confirmation hearing, John Glenn, the chairman of the Senate Oversight Committee, said, well, why does the government have so much trouble with IT systems? <clears throat> and I said, well, I just got here. But I can tell you the private sector doesn't have a 100% record either. So as I was at OMB and, and the annual budget reviews, it became clear that <clears throat> there was a significant challenge for the large complicated systems the government was developing because a lot of times uh, billions of dollars were spent and not much was accomplished. <clears throat> so we put together a task force 
Uh, my career is full of task forces and organizations. Of, I asked uh, the director, I said, I just want the smartest people in the government at IT. I don't care whether they're political appointees or career people. And GAO had done a good study of what worked in the private sector. They had the 10 best private sector companies. So we sat down <clears throat> and went through the ex entire procurement process, management process, and it turned out there were a set of very common sense issues. One was that you should not have three to five year projects. You should have <clears throat> projects that might take three to five years, but had deliverables every 12 to 18 months. So you could see what worked and make sure that that part of the system worked before you built the next part. Because if you waited for five years, as the government often did, as they built these mammoth systems, uh, at a minimum, you were five years out of date by that time, because everything had been designed five or six years earlier. And secondly, when it pushed the switch, it almost never worked. And that didn't, and that happened in the private sector as well as the public sector. So we set a set of rules up and blew up what was called the Brooks Act, which governed IT procurement for 40 years, and basically required agencies when they came in for funding to explain that they were using off-the-shelf software to the extent possible, that they had deliverables, they had modules that they were going to be doing, and that way OMB could monitor the progress uh, that was made. And so it turned out to be uh, you know, an, uh, an effective way, and it taught me a lot about IT, uh, which helped me in my next job. So what was your next job? So I was at OMB for three years and then <clears throat> left in the summer of 97, figuring I'd take a sabbatical. My wife had been ill and gotten uh, well and we were gonna go travel. <clears throat> and uh, I, I'm a soccer fan, so I was gonna end up at the World Cup in France in the summer of 98. So along the way, <clears throat> we were coming back from Morocco in uh, January of uh, 98. And at two in the morning, I got a call. I was at the airport hotel in Amsterdam on the way back. <clears throat> at two o'clock, I got an excited call from the desk clerk saying, it's the White House calling. And it turned out it was my successor <clears throat> saying the president was concerned about the year 2000 <clears throat> and wanted me to come back and, and take it on. And as I noted, we had created chief information officers in all the federal agencies and the focus was on whether the government would be ready. <clears throat> and so I told the, the caller, Ed DeSev, I said, you know, the government's gonna be in good shape. We set it up uh, with the CIOs and they're all working on it, but I'll be happy to talk to you. So I came back. Uh, the president actually called me then a couple of nights later, and I was just, I've always thought it would be fun to run a center city school system and make sure that it, and demonstrate you could run it well. And the president was interested in all sorts of things, including education. So late one night, we spent about 10 or 15 minutes talking about non-traditional educators managing school systems. And I had just started talking to the city of Baltimore about running their schools. <clears throat> so he concluded the discussion by saying, well, promise me, if you do that, which I think would be fun, uh, you'll help me find somebody to do the year 2000. And I said, Mr. President, I promise you I'll do that. So I told my wife as we hung up, there are now going to be two or three unhappy people in the White House because the job of the president is to sign you up, not to come back and say, hey, you know, Koskin is really going to do something interesting. <clears throat> so the next night, the vice president calls, and I'd gotten to know him well through the reinventing government initiatives. And uh, well enough that when he called, I said, you know, if you get the Pope to call me, I might actually take this job. Uh, so as I told my wife, Pat, afterwards, I said, you know, if I don't take this job, I'm never going to get another job in Washington because you can't turn down the president and the vice president. So <clears throat> we started off. And again, GAO had done an analysis of the critical infrastructure of the country. And we created the President's Council on year 2000 with all the federal agencies, including all the regulators, the Federal Reserve Board, the FTC, <clears throat> the SEC, because everyone was affected. And we sat down one afternoon and said, okay, what would be the problems if IT systems failed? Where would the disasters be? So the usual suspects were power, transportation, telecommunication, financial institutions. But by the time we got through the afternoon with these very smart people, we had 25 areas. We had pharmaceuticals, hospitals, we had state and local government, we had education, we had a series <clears throat> of complicated areas where nobody knew what was going on. And so the strategy we developed <clears throat> was to create a working partnership with the companies or the organizations in each of those 25 areas so that we could facilitate and support them in their work. And the goal was to convince them 
uh, that we weren't from the government, we really were trying to help and we weren't gonna tell them what to do, that we were going to simply try to organize the industries. We ultimately did the most important thing, which was get the Congress to pass legislation <clears throat> limiting the liability of companies if they exchanged information with each other and it turned out not to be totally accurate, uh, that they wouldn't sue each other or couldn't be able to sue each other. And they also, the lawyers were concerned <clears throat> that they would be viewed as violating the Antitrust Act if all of the power companies got together or the automobile companies. So the, the legislation had to say that as long as they weren't fixing markets or prices, that they wouldn't be in violation of the Antitrust Act. Uh, we had to get that done by unanimous consent, of course, because time was running out. Uh, <clears throat> one of the senior staffers of the Senate Judiciary Committee said, you know, you're asking for a miracle. And I said, well, you know, everybody deserves a miracle sometime. But with a little luck and some conversations and explaining to everybody from the American trial lawyers to Ralph Nader to senators that if you could only do one thing, this would be the most important thing to do. Uh, it actually passed by unanimous consent in the Senate. And one day, about four o'clock in the afternoon, the consent calendar in the House came up. Any one of the 435 congressmen and women could have objected and didn't have to say anything, it would have killed it. And the clerk read the bill. It was some <clears throat> nice sounding bill like uh, assisting Y2K or something. And uh, said, are there objections? And there was a pause and nobody objected and it passed. And I told my staff, I said, there are about 20 people in Washington who understand what really went on. So the net result of that was suddenly information flowed freely <clears throat> in each of these areas. Companies were helping each other. We began, you, it got to a point where you could tell a company, a chemical plant, here's the things you ought to look at. Don't worry about the rest of it. And so the prodigal sons, those who came late to the game, benefited by all the work that everybody else had done. Uh, it turned out, <clears throat> I thought, well, the world would take care of itself. Uh, but I went to the UN to at the an informatics working committee to explain what we were doing and learn what they were doing. And, and, and Ahmad Kamal, the permanent ambassador from Pakistan chaired that committee. And he called me in the summer of 98 and said, we're gonna have to do something. And it was one of those, what do you mean? We're gonna have to do something. And he said, the UN has no interest in taking this on and the developing countries as well as the developed countries are all out there reinventing the wheel. So I said, okay, so we created a steering group of 12, country Y2K coordinators. I'd met a number of them over the past six months to be the steering group because I didn't want it to look like it was just a US initiative. And I thought if we could get 20 or 30 countries to the UN in December sharing information and organizing themselves, that would be a great step forward. Uh, when we got done with it all, we had 100 countries meeting in the trusteeship council of the UN in December. <clears throat> and they all insisted that we get together again the following June to compare notes and also uh, to um, talk about contingency planning. So we organized the 12 coordinators had been selected by continent. So we organized the world by continent. South America was Chile and <clears throat> Africa was Morocco and Ghana and uh, Japan and <clears throat> the Philippines took Asia and uh, Bulgaria took Eastern, uh, uh, the Eastern states and Europe. Uh, England took the European Union. And so what we did for the period was let them organize whatever meetings they wanted and we would provide experts on power, telecommunication, whatever it was. We met again in June, there were 170 countries came together in June of 1999, the largest meeting in the history of the UN except for a general assembly. And by this time they all knew each other, they'd been sharing information, we had a wonderful three days talking about contingency plans where you needed to uh, deal with the issue. So came the end of the year, I had said I would fly because I was confident the FAA would replace its entire system, which the last time they'd done took four years. And uh, I did press conferences every four hours, starting with New Zealand. So we monitored the world as it turned. And as you know, <clears throat> most systems worked. <clears throat> Some didn't. The Japanese lost the ability to monitor the safety systems on their nuclear plants. The defense intelligence satellite system went down. Uh, the low-level wind shear detectors at major airports around the country went down as I was flying into LaGuardia Airport, but it was a nice night, so there was no wind shear. So all of those systems people cared about. We were very transparent. We gave, in my press conferences, we discussed those things. But by midnight, <clears throat> when I went to see the press who had gathered in our uh, coordination center, we had 700 media accredited, 
Sam Donaldson of ABC was grouching about the fact that, well, nothing really happened. And I said, Sam, two things. One is we've been telling you for six months that the basic major systems are going to work. And they did. And you guys are the ones who've been saying the world is coming to an end. And secondly, we've been talking about all the things that didn't work. And you don't care because nobody died. I said, if there's not blood in the streets, you don't think it was a problem. So sure enough, within 24 hours, my prediction was true. When I started, I did an interview and I said, it's the great bag holder job of all times. <clears throat> if it goes well, people are going to say, what was that all about? And if it doesn't go well, they'll say, what was the name of that guy who was supposed to keep this from happening? <clears throat> so within 24 hours, everybody was saying, well, what a waste of time. Uh, more people have been interested more recently because now 20 years later, people understand how complicated and integrated IT systems are. But I've always said, I don't know anybody who worked in a power company, a financial institution, a telecommunication company who thinks they wasted any time or any money because they had all rolled their clocks forward and knew those systems wouldn't work. Uh, so it was a fascinating time. It sounds like it was. Now, did you go from there to the uh, to deputy mayor and city administrator of Washington? I went from there. Uh, Alice Rivlin had been the director of OMB when I was the deputy director for management. And she had gone to the Fed and then was now chairing the financial stability board uh, for the district, which had basically gone into bankruptcy. And Tony Williams, who had been the CFO at Agriculture when I was deputy mayor, deputy director of OMB, and I got to know because I helped him with some problems he had, and now become the mayor of the district. So as Y2K ended, <clears throat> as I get it, there was a pincers movement of Alice for the Federal Control Board and Tony as the mayor saying, hey, how would you like to be uh, deputy mayor and city administrator? And so since I live in Washington, <clears throat> I said, sure. And it was a difficult time because the dot-com bubble burst had just burst, and so revenues were down. Uh, the district had to suddenly find almost $400 million in a budget already established uh, that they had to cut back because their revenues were going to drop. And I, I said that in some ways I was concerned that there were people who were going to think I had this black cloud over my head as I go from one, managing one crisis to another. Because a year later, of course, uh, I'm uh, managing the day-to-day -day operations of the city for 9-11 uh, as the plane flies into the Pentagon. And we have to try to figure out on that day <clears throat> how to get people home, uh, how to keep the government open, uh, and then ultimately how to respond to improve the emergency management response and capacity for the city. So we get that settled down, we got the budget settled down, and the next thing you know, we have the sniper who is out, uh, <clears throat> two of them driving around the district <clears throat> and Maryland and Virginia shooting people, killing uh, 12 or 14 people in the course of several months and panicking the entire, uh, uh, entire area. And then <clears throat> to make life interesting, we have uh, anthrax mailings to postal workers, a couple of whom unfortunately died. Uh, so it was an inter another interesting three years, uh, at which point um, I thought, okay, this has been fun. And um, uh, I think three years is a good time. As I told people at my going away party, managing the District of Columbia, which is more difficult than any state, any city, because it's a state and a county and a city all rolled up in one. So we had the state Medicaid department, the mental health department, the transportation uh, department, uh, <clears throat> the Department of Public Works, the motor vehicles department. A lot, as I said, a lot of different ways people could get into mischief or trouble. So as I said at my going away party, managing the district for three years was enough to cure you of your need to do public service. <laughs> uh, let's go back to 9-11. I'll bet you've got some stories about that. Uh, there are. I was giving a talk at the uh, local, in effect, Chamber of Commerce, <clears throat> and I finished just before nine o'clock. And as I walked out into the uh, reception area, they had a big TV, <clears throat> and there was a picture of a plane flying into the World Trade Center. And my first thought was, that's got to be a movie. And then <clears throat> people said, no, and I could tell this was really happening. So I got in my car to drive. It was on the other side of downtown Washington, so I had to drive across the city in front of the White House. And smoke <clears throat> was coming, and it looked like it was coming from behind the White House, and it looked like I thought it must be the State Department or somebody's blown another plane. It turned out it was the plane that hit the Pentagon. So by the time I got back to the city uh, hall, <clears throat> which was, uh, as I say, on uh, 15, 18 blocks away, 
obviously traffic is uh, coming to a stop. <clears throat> Somebody had instructed city workers they should all go home. So I had to countermand that and say, no, no, no. Uh, and because people said, well, the federal government is getting ready to shut down because we always coordinate it. And I said, yeah, but nobody depends on the federal government for day in and day out services. We've got people who depend for <clears throat> social services, uh, the public works department, everybody else. And besides, nobody's going to get home in this traffic because it was gridlocked. So we had everybody stay at work. Uh, the you know, a woman who was running the Department of Public Works says, well, we've got trash trucks all over the city. Should we get them back in? And I said, nobody, this is about 10 o'clock. I said, nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows where, <clears throat> how many planes are out there. I said, we may need to have trucks able to move things or people around, so leave them out there, uh, let them do their work. So we had the cleanest city in the middle of 9-11. Um, the guy who made the clutch decision, <clears throat> I talked to uh, the uh, emergency operations director at Metro and <clears throat> asked him what he was doing. If you looked out my window, all you saw were cars backed up uh, one after another. And I said, are you gonna keep running? And he said, yeah, it's the only way people are gonna get home. And I've always said, you know, you make those decisions and then you see what happens. <clears throat> Had somebody with a satchel bomb showed up <clears throat> on a metro car, that decision would have been critiqued and criticized for years. But on the other hand, it allowed people to get home, parents to get to uh, try to get home to their kids. <clears throat> and it was uh, the only way that uh, you could actually alleviate some of the stress on the system. I also ended up talking to the superintendent of the schools for the district. And he had made the decision to keep the schools operating because he could tell there was gridlock. And as he said, again, the right decision, uh, you didn't want to send kids out into that gridlock so their parents wouldn't know where they were. So we announced the schools were open. The parents knew their school, kids were in school. We figured, I looked at the schools that were most likely to be subject to an attack. Because again, we're all flying blind. We don't know how organized this terrorist attack is, whether they clearly are attacking Washington with a plane into the Pentagon. So we arranged with the police department to provide protection to those schools that looked like they were most in harm's way uh, during that day. So <clears throat> later in the morning, by noon or one o'clock, uh, the communication department show up and I get a satellite phone. And I thought, well, it's a little late in the day to have this satellite phone because you could not, you know, lines were down, it was hard to get through. And the only way the satellite phones work, a big phone, was you had to go up on the roof. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and it wasn't clear who, who was on the other satellite phones. They were distributing them to the senior uh, managers and executives. So later on, we got everybody to understand, uh, you know, how you used it, uh, who you would call and where it would go. Uh, and as of course, <clears throat> it, it's fun to deal with the press when you're in these things. So we got through the day <clears throat> and as organized a way as you could, responding to the various challenges. And the deputy uh, chief of police got interviewed and said, well, you know, we didn't have a plan for this. So at the end of the day, the next morning, the Washington Post headline is, city had no plan. And I told somebody, I don't think anybody had a plan for planes flying into buildings all around the United States. Uh, and I thought, I told somebody, you would have thought we'd have gotten a little credit for having not panicked, having organized the place, having responded appropriately. Uh, so <clears throat> it comes with the territory uh, that it, when you're in the middle of these things, uh, you know, people will look for uh, Y2K was a, uh, you know, a fake, all of that work was wasted, or gee, the city didn't seem to have a plan <laughs> for a terrorist attack. Uh, within a couple of weeks, we had a pretty good plan for a terrorist attack. In fact, my, again, my funny story is uh, one of the things that people don't know was the emergency managers of all the major cities were at a conference in Montana that day. And of course, all plane traffic stopped. The only way those people, executives, got back to New York, to Washington, the rest was the Army sent a plane and had to fly them all back. <clears throat> and it was just an interesting side note that we were all running this, New York and everybody else with the manage, emergency management people stuck out in the middle of Montana. So we started having uh, regular meetings called on the spur of the moment to test the system. And <clears throat> one day we were doing it, the mayor and I are sitting in the emergency management uh, headquarters and there's nobody from the health department. And I asked somebody, I said, well, what's going on? And I said, well, you know, he's in New York. And I said, well, you know, I don't think the terrorists are going to call in advance and say, we're coming next Tuesday. 
make sure everybody's in town. I said, you know, I think we have to have a plan and a program where if the head of the department is out of town, there's somebody else who responds to this emergency notice. So it was, as I say, a kind of fascinating, uh, fascinating <clears throat> insight into what it takes to actually run a big city. Now, some of the younger people that are listening are probably thinking, well, why didn't they just use their cell phone? <laughs> uh, well, at that point in time, a good point. Uh, <clears throat> not many people had cell phones. And in fact, <clears throat> what I had was a Motorola pager that you could laboriously type messages on. And uh, everybody running the city did that. And I remember driving to um, actually a Duke basketball game. <clears throat> and I had, I was up driving along, I'm getting these messages on my pager. And my wife yells at me and insists we stop <laughs> so that I can actually respond. But it was, if you think a flip phone, uh, which I still actually have, is remediary, you should see what the old Motorola pagers used to look like. Uh, so yeah, we were all stuck with landlines at that point, or these big satellite phones, if you could stand on a roof somewhere, and you could get a, a hold of somebody who also had a satellite phone that didn't do you any good getting hold of a landline. Those were what? Those satellite phones are about eight inches tall? <clears throat> yeah, eight to ten inches. They were, yeah. you know, uh, they, <clears throat> they looked like Get Smart. I mean, you had them up here, and they covered your whole head. And And we thought anybody that had a car phone was just like really rich, right? Yes, I don't know, those were there when I was at uh, <clears throat> the White House, both for OMBN for the year 2000, <clears throat> there were White House cars driven by the Secret Service that would take you to appointments and they had a car phone. And so I spent all my time, because I was on the phone all the time, just dialing people and talking to them. And yeah, you really did feel like uh, this is the way to live. And so I, sometimes I thought, maybe I'll just drive around town and call people on the phone. <laughs> Why not? Why not? <clears throat> right. Well, I'm sure there's even more stories. You know, I think about anthrax and how in the world did, you know, what did you do during that period? Well, <clears throat> again, it's a uh, problem with Y2K, problem with any uh, emergency, the 9-11. <clears throat> Uh, the challenge is to deal with the problem without at the same time panicking the public. <clears throat> and you have to get in the sniper the same way. You have to get people to understand the nature of the problem. You have to be transparent about what you're doing. But at the same time, you have to reassure the public <clears throat> that as a general matter, uh, even anthrax or the sniper isn't going to affect, unfortunately, fortunately, more than a few people who sadly will end up, end up being adversely affected, but two people <clears throat> and the postal system who died from anthrax, you know, was a great tragedy. But the goal was to have uh, people understand that most mail wasn't going to have anthrax in it and that you could be careful in, uh, about it. So you had to try to surround the problem, work with the postal service and everyone else, and <clears throat> try to make sure that the employees in the postal service felt comfortable that they were uh, protected uh, as you went through it all. Ultimately, there <clears throat> was no easy answer uh, to the anthrax issue. Uh, but it continues to be a threat. Uh, public officials, uh, I, I was a kid when I was the IRS commissioner, <clears throat> that you know, you, the mail was all soaked in oil before you got it, so it didn't have anything that would uh, be a problem. Uh, <clears throat> so it is, as I say, uh, the, the challenge for any uh, public official is to try to address the problem, deal with it effectively in an organized way, but at the same time, <clears throat> provide enough information to the public that they respond appropriately and don't overreact. Oh, that's interesting. And then you went on to the U.S. Soccer Foundation, which is kind of a real jump on to the other side. All right. Uh, my wife says, don't get me started talking about soccer. It's a half hour shot. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I've always been a sports fan. And so when my kids, I never played soccer. I was a football player. But <clears throat> so my kids, when they were young, my wife, enrolls them in what's called Montgomery Soccer Inc, MSI. It's a rec program for five, six-year-olds. <clears throat> so I start uh, showing up at uh, games and then practices, and then the next thing you know, I'm uh, the assistant coach. <clears throat> and then I think, well, I gotta learn something about this sort of U US Federation, the governing board, provides licensing courses. So I take <clears throat> licensing courses, state courses, national courses to learn how to coach. I coached for about 10 years. And then along the way, made the mistake of telling somebody when the NASL in the 60s was, uh, or the <clears throat> into the 80s was collapsing, 
that if they ever started a league, I'd be happy to be involved. So the next thing I know, I'm the vice chairman of the American Soccer League with 10 for semi-pro except professional teams on the East Coast in 1987. The U.S. gets the World Cup in 88. And the next thing I know, we're organizing, I'm in charge of the organizing committee for uh, the District of Columbia uh, to host games in the 94 World Cup. And so we got to raise money and the city's bankrupt, you know, so I'm doing it all. Uh, and in fact, I always use an example that I've always said in management, a group of people around a table will always make a better decision than any member of that group, no matter how experienced or smart that individual thinks they are. So we've got an organizing committee for the World Cup and it's soccer coaches and, you know, people who don't necessarily come, haven't come out of, you know, major management backgrounds. <clears throat> and we're trying to figure out with a bankrupt city, how do you raise funds to get this going? And somebody said, we should sell t-shirts. And I said, no, that's what soccer clubs do, t-shirts. Yeah, we sold 67,000 t-shirts <clears throat> and funded <laughs> the whole thing. And I said, I never would have sold t-shirts, but the group said, let's do it. And I said, well, it makes some sense. Let's try it. <clears throat> and I've had serious examples of group decision-making as well throughout my career. So I advise people, uh, if you're running anything, make sure you surround yourself with the people doing the work and then listen to what they have to say. So in any event, <clears throat> the foundation is created out of the 1994 World Cup. Alan Rothenberg had run the <clears throat> Olympic soccer in Los Angeles in 86, and so knew that the Federation was broke and he didn't want any surplus funds, which nobody thought there would be any, going to waste. So he said, we'll create a national foundation. <clears throat> so, cause I'd been involved in all these things, youth soccer, professional soccer. I'm one of the nine people elected to the board of uh, the soccer foundation in 1994. <clears throat> but that's just before I go to OMB. And of course I have to step down from all my outside engagements when I do that. So I get done with Y2K. And in the meantime, they've expanded the board to having uh, uh, people who are selected as directors in addition to the nine who are elected across the country. <clears throat> so Rothenberg, whom I'd gotten to know well as we were trying to run uh, the World Cup, uh, without asking me, appoints me to the board. So I'm on the board of the foundation. And so when I leave the city, a few months later, three or four months later, the president of the foundation announces he's leaving and the board says, well, would you on an interim basis at least fill in? Because you know about the game and you've been a member of the board for four years. And I said, sure. So after a couple of weeks, I thought, well, you know, <clears throat> you could turn this into a juggernaut. Uh, why not? So I signed up. I said, okay, I'll sign up for the same term my predecessor had, which turned out to be four years. <clears throat> and uh, and this will be the last thing I do before I retire. So we did that. <clears throat> At that point, the foundation was raising money, had $55 million in an endowment from the World Cup. So there were surplus funds. And it was funding primarily suburban programs because that's where the game was growing with soccer moms and kids, where my kids had played. But it was clear by that time, as I explained to the grants committee and then the board of uh, directors, <clears throat> by that time the suburbs had a lot of money and had soccer moms. And so they appreciated the grants, but they really didn't need the money. The place that needed the money was urban areas, inner cities where kids didn't have anything like those opportunities. And while we had funded a grant or two there, I said, we ought to just focus all of our grants, a couple million dollars, $3 million a year <clears throat> on urban areas. So a couple of directors said, well, you know, our support comes from the suburbs. And if they know we're not putting money into the suburbs again, they're, they're gonna quit supporting us. And I said, no, I'll bet what happens <clears throat> is they'll understand that their kids have all of these opportunities that the kids in urban areas don't have for soccer or even athletics generally. And they'll be delighted uh, to be supported. And it'll make them feel good about the fact that their kids are out on these beautiful green fields and the kids in the urban areas are struggling. So sure enough, that's what we did. And we built a consortium again on my bring them all together and uh, reason to that. We had a meeting and paid for everybody running an inner city program on the East Coast to come to Washington for two or three days. And the theory was they'd all exchange information about how they were doing it, what their challenges were. They'd pick up good ideas and we could be supportive not by funding them all, but by providing uh, operational support <clears throat> for meetings and gatherings like that. So the Urban Soccer Coalition still exists. They invited me uh, while I was at the IRS to come to the 10th anniversary celebration. Uh, <clears throat> and the four years ended. Um, we uh, re uh, replaced, we did a national search and selected a wonderful guy who was a director, Ed Foster Simeon, 
in 2004, who's been there now for uh, 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 a long time. I guess he's been there since I left in uh, 2008 for 12 years, and he's done a spectacular job. <clears throat> They're building goal is a thousand what we call mini pitches in the suburbs we were financing a big soccer field 70 by 110 yards and people say well that's why the problem is it never grow in the center city because there aren't big spaces and i said <clears throat> but you could have small spaces so these mini pitches are about the size of a uh, tennis court a soccer foundation now and con uh, con uh, contributions from uh, major league soccer and a lot of sponsors has a goal of building a thousand of those in urban areas across the country. They've already headed almost to 500 and it's been fun to watch. <clears throat> so my four years came and went and I went into my first retirement. Well, I know the IRS is in there someplace. So that's the last thing at least I have to ask about. Well, I will tell you how I got there. First of all, we've already talked about Freddie Mac <clears throat> and I think I, that it, I, my retirement lasted about six weeks. <clears throat> and then I got this call on my cell phone saying, you don't know us, but we've heard about you. <clears throat> We'd like to talk to you about a local company we're interested in. And I said, well, you said the magic words local and that led to Freddie Mac. So as I said, the Freddie Mac <clears throat> rules and uh, uh, limitations uh, were that you could not be a director after age 72. So they asked, would you like to change that so you have a broader selection pool? And I said, absolutely not. I was 69 at the time. That's my ticket out of here. <laughs> so three and a half years later, I reached age 72 and with another director at Freddie and one at Fannie, we all uh, left and I started my second attempt at retirement. <clears throat> this time I did better. It lasted about a year until the spring, late spring, May of 2013, <clears throat> when the Washington Post ran a big article about IRS uh, <clears throat> challenged on targeting of uh, conservative organizations. And there was a big hearing and they were firing everybody, uh, running the uh, senior people at the IRS. And I thought that's not a good thing because uh, I knew a lot of people in the Obama White House from uh, their carryover from the Clinton days. <clears throat> and a guy who I'd worked with for Y2K in the Senate, Senator Hatch <clears throat> said, on the floor, well, what the government ought to do is just get somebody who knows how to run things, maybe out of the private sector, to take over. So I always kidded him that it was all his fault. But sure enough, within a few days, I got a call from the White House saying, how would I like to be the IRS commissioner? <clears throat> and I always get asked, well, how long did it take you to figure out the answer to that? Did you talk to your wife and everything? And I said, oh, it took me about 15 seconds. And I said, sure because it sounded like it would be fun. I knew how important the IRS was because I had worked with them when I was the deputy uh, director for management and I had worked with Charles Rosati, the commissioner then for Y2K because they had huge technology challenges. And of course, everybody, for a lot of people, the only interaction they have with the federal government is paying their taxes and dealing with the IRS. So <clears throat> I was, uh, it, it, <laughs> the confirmation process is something uh, my, before I even got officially nominated, um, my taxes got uh, <clears throat> re-audited for six years because, of course, they didn't want the new commissioner to have a problem. And fortunately, what turned out is the only questions were I had underestimated my refunds, so I had refunds coming. And then the White House, of course, got very nervous. Well, gee, wow, you know, the IRS filed tax returns that went totally accurate. When I talked to Senator Hatch, they said, well, you got to talk to Hatch, who was then chairman of the Finance Committee. I, I was the ranking member in the Finance Committee. Baucus was the chairman. So I talked to Hatch, who remembered when we were chatting, and I told him that you know people were a little nervous about that. And they said, well, if you got refunds, I don't know why anybody would be troubled by it. Uh, you didn't pay enough taxes. I mean, you paid too much taxes. <clears throat> so by the time I was announced in August uh, and got uh, through the nomination process and the Democrats decided to go nuclear and maintain that uh, you didn't need um, two-thirds, you could actually get a majority vote or 60, per 60 votes. You could get, do anything with a majority vote except Supreme Court judges. So that got to be controversial and my nomination is the first one in the middle of all that. So it was December uh, when I started, uh, actually December 23rd, that was my Christmas present to myself was to get the start <laughs> taking over the IRS. And so I hadn't realized there was a term, but 20 years earlier when they restructured the IRS, the restructuring commission said the commissioner ought to have a five-year term so that there would be continuity and it would encourage people to stay longer than two or three years. 
and it would not be conterminous with the president's term except every 20 years. So I suddenly discovered there was a five-year term and I decided, okay, that's a fixed term and one year had already gone since my predecessor had left. And so I've got four years to go. But a few months later, I thought, you know, I should check on this <laughs> to see what it's like. So I Googled IRS commissioner's term and I start reading this uh, chief counsel's opinion. It sounds like it's a floating five-year term. And then in the middle of it all, there's a little footnote that says Congress passed a legislation making clear it was a fixed five-year term, at which point I quit reading and decided four years it is. So it was a, um, <laughs> it was fascinating. Uh, <clears throat> the IRS has, you know, collects over $3 trillion a year, processes 150 million tax returns from individuals, uh, has an antiquated IT system running programs that were running when John F. Kennedy was president. So it's full of challenges. <clears throat> The Republicans by then had uh, taken control of, uh, <clears throat> by the 2014 election, uh, <clears throat> the uh, Congress and had already started cutting the IRS budget uh, before the targeting scandal because they were trying to make it difficult for the IRS to implement the Affordable Care Act. Uh, so we <clears throat> ended up by, the, the only way the IRS can deal with budget cuts is it has no reserves, is basically not replace people when they leave. So in the four years I was there, we lost 20,000, 20% 20 of the workforce, 20,000 employees <clears throat> and uh, created obviously challenges around across the board. As I told the employees, I went to, I said, when I started, because I've always wanted, said, want to know what's going on in an organization, talk to the people doing the work. And I said, I'd like to see the offices and visit them. And somebody said, there are over 500. And I said, I'd like to visit some of the offices. And so <clears throat> I went to every, went to two cities a week for three and a half months doing town halls with frontline employees. Uh, and I told them, I said, you know, the problem with this organization is the employers are so good and so dedicated that no matter what happens, they keep producing a reasonably flawless filing season. They keep uh, accomplishing things like implementing this massive Affordable Care Act. Tax uh, <clears throat> reform is done and that gets done as well. And, and in fact, the Congress says, well, <clears throat> if we cut the budget and they kept functioning, we could keep cutting the budget. So it was the uh, significant challenge going through identity theft and refund fraud was a problem when I started. <clears throat> we were sending close to $6 billion to criminals and terrorists around the world who were stealing identities and filing false refunds. Um, and then, of course, we had this issue of trying to make sure the management issue that had led to the delay, nobody was denied, but the delay of the process processing of applications from Tea Party groups and very liberal groups as well, who wanted to be social welfare organizations and tax exempt, but also be politically active. And the rule was you couldn't spend more than half your time being a political activist and still be tax exempt. So we had to straighten out that entire process while everybody on the Hill was yelling at us. And it was so much fun, of course, that the Tea Party uh, representatives, the so-called Freedom Caucus, decided that <clears throat> it was all my fault somehow. Uh, even though it happened before me. So they uh, mounted a campaign to impeach the IRS commissioner, <clears throat> which I thought was interesting because if they were successful, I would be the first <clears throat> government executive other than the president impeached in 150 years, I think it was, and only one other person had. Um, so they kept at it and, um, you know, I thought, well, okay, we'll see how they do. And they finally lost uh, the floor vote uh, was voted to refer it back to committee and not to <laughs> proceed. Uh, and so I lost my chance to be a footnote in history. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I ended up the last year of my term was the first year of the Trump administration. And so the Freedom Caucus and a lot of their associates, 50 of them or so, kept writing letters, or two or three letters to the White House saying, got to fire the IRS commissioner. And what they finally figured out, I had never hidden it, was <clears throat> I knew the president personally. Uh, <clears throat> I had negotiated with him when we were running the Penn Central in bankruptcy in the mid-70s, the first transaction he ever did personally, which was to convert the old Commodore Hotel, which sat on the top of Grand Central, into the Grand Hyatt, which he redeveloped, built, and ran. And I think it may have been the best... Uh, uh, deal he ever did because he started the discussions and bought the hotel. It was closed by that time in the middle of the bankruptcy of New York in 1975. And by the time he opened in 1978, inflation was rampant. Every other bad hotel in New York had closed. You couldn't get a hotel room. 
So he ended up at 20% more occupancy and $25 a night more uh, rate than he had projected in his financials to get the loan from the equity. So I think he always had a fond spot in his heart for me. So um, uh, needless to say, <clears throat> uh, the Trump administration did not fire the IRS commissioner and I managed to finish my term uh, as the last standing Obama appointee uh, in November of 2017. Well, you certainly have had an interesting life. I, you know, if someone else shangs, hangs a shiny bobble in front of you, are you going to say yes again? Uh, you know, <laughs> somebody, somebody once at Duke, where I've done a lot of different things, said, my problem is I don't know how to say no. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, as I always say, well, if nominated, I'd run. If elected, I'd serve. And uh, of course, I've, my checkered employment career, as I call it, is such that over time, the only thing I get called for is, well, we got this big problem we don't know what to do with. How would you like to do it? And, uh, and people have asked me even now, reporters and friends, well, aren't you glad you're not at the IRS in the middle of all this? And I tell them in honesty, uh, I think it would be fun to be there. Uh, you know, it's a great challenge. I think they're doing a wonderful job, you know, <laughs> in the middle of the filing season, trying to protect their employees against the coronavirus. A lot of them now teleworking or at home. Uh, they get told, hey, how would you like to send money to 150 million people? Uh, and they're pulling it off. Uh, so it would be fun to, to meet that challenge, to work with a really great workforce. The IRS uh, employees are as good a workforce as any I've ever been uh, fortunate to be associated with. Uh, yeah. So it is, a, it is a character flaw that, yeah, I would, uh, <laughs> I would take on anything. I wouldn't call it a checkerboard career. I would call it a chess career because every place you've moved, you seem to have jumped into the position that you needed to be, put your head down and kept swinging and come out of it pretty darn well, if you ask me. Uh, well, you're kind to uh, frame it that way. I may actually adopt that. Uh, chess sounds a little more intellectually <laughs> challenging than, than checkerboard. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but I do feel, and I, I always tell people, I'm uh, <clears throat> blessed and I feel fortunate to have had the opportunity uh, to fill a lot of these uh, interesting and challenging positions. And uh, to some extent, <clears throat> part of the reason I've been able to get through them is that my management philosophy uh, picked up along the way has been that you need to surround yourself with good people. And, and I, as I say, I was the commissioner of the IRS with 100,000 people when I started as a kind of classic command and control organization which large organizations tend to have to be. You want everybody moving more or less in the same direction at the same time. Uh, and so I always had to be careful to not say anything without thinking about it, but people would say, well, a commissioner wants to do X and off they go. But I tell people through all of that sturm and drang, all of the challenges of, you know, we reduced identity theft by over 70% by, again, a set of partnerships with H&R Block and Intuit and TurboTax and all the state tax commissioners. I tell people I never made a decision as IRS commissioner on my own. I always talked to the senior executives. As you say, I wandered around the country talking to them. I talked to 22,000 IRS employees in person. So through all of it, through Y2K, where we built partnerships with uh, uh, companies and organizations around the world, blowing up the Brooks Act, redoing the way the government does IT was a group effort by very smart people who dealt with IT and the government for years. Uh, and so you know, part of the, I think, the reason I got it through unscathed somewhat was that, uh, you know, it, it was never me. In fact, somebody asked me once, a couple of reporters, about my legacy at the IRS. And I said, well, you know, <clears throat> first of all, people who leave an organization and say, this is what I accomplished, make a mistake because you don't accomplish it. The people there accomplish it. But I said, more importantly, if the initiatives, and we had a number of them at the IRS that we, in, we put in place, if those were viewed as the commissioner's initiative, that's what Commissioner Koskinen wants done, when the commissioner leaves, those things won't survive. The only initiatives uh, and uh, projects that survive are those that are owned by the people running them, the people, and they feel they've developed them, they're their systems, and they keep them, and it keeps going. So, um, you know, my sense of my legacy is I got the opportunity to work with a lot of very good people who came up with great ideas and the place ran better when I left, thanks to them, uh, not necessarily thanks to me. 
Well, thank you so much for telling us all about it because it's a great piece of oral history just to go through each one of those areas. So thank you, John. And I hope your the rest of your time during this pandemic period goes well. Well, thanks very much for having me. Obviously, I've enjoyed it. It's been a great pleasure. And uh, good luck to you and everyone watching. Stay safe.